Hey there, folks. Uh, here is your lecture for today. Um, I think that's pretty good in terms of glare on the board. Yeah, we'll work with this. Okay, so today we're talking about mass media. Um, mass media is not something that is covered in your book, so there was no reading, uh, but here are the things that I would like you to know. So when we talk about mass media, we are talking, boom, about any form of communication that addresses a mass audience. Um, it's one source and millions and billions of receivers. So when we talk about mass media, we are talking about television, we are talking about radio, we are talking about the internet, uh, we are talking about blogs that have a wide readership, we are talking about um, music of uh, artists who sell bazillions and bazillions of albums. Uh, we are talking about billboards. Uh, we are talking about commercials, ads. We're talking about news programs. Um, we are talking about uh, published materials, magazines, books. Um, but mass media, the idea is that it's a form of communication that has the potential to reach tons and tons and tons and tons of people, hence the word mass. Um, when we talk about mass media, um, we are not talking about like a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're having or a group chat that you're in in a chat room. Um, we are not talking about email uh, unless you have a bazillion friends. Um, we're really talking about something that enters into the world, um, sort of affects culture much more broadly than other forms of communication, uh, and that can have, like we said, millions and billions of receivers. Um, so that's what we mean by mass media when we're talking about mass media. Films fall into this too, uh, music videos, uh, the list goes on and on and on. Um, two things that we want to keep in mind about mass media. First, um, mass media uh, becomes popular and becomes mass media because it serves our needs and desires. So we go to mass media for a variety of reasons. Um, sometimes uh, many of you go to mass media to be distracted when you don't want to do homework or something else like that. You find some sort of mass media, Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, you start Snapchatting with folks. Um, these are all forms of mass media that can be used to distract. Sometimes we go to mass media for entertainment, films, uh, music, uh, some of us who are readers. Um, sometimes we go to mass media for information. Uh, this would be if you go to Wikipedia, for example, uh, or you go to some type of website that gives you kind of DIY how to do steps. Uh, a lot of times we go to uh, mass media for um, our news to be informed about what's going on in the world. What's important though is mass media gets to be mass um, because it serves many people's needs and desires. What's also important to remember though is that mass media focuses and distracts our attention. So mass media can be both good and both bad. It is not entirely good. It is not entirely bad. Um, sometimes it focuses our attention on things that need um, that we need to know, that we need to be about. Sometimes it distracts our attention and turns it away toward other things. Um, and now, a lot of times we're responsible for, for going to it for distraction. But what I'm talking about here uh, is um, think about news stations, okay? Uh, let's take CNN and let's take Fox News. Uh, something could happen in the world today. And if I went to CNN and watched the coverage of that event, CNN's coverage of that event could highlight certain portions of that event and kind of hide or not make as big a deal about other portions of that event. Chances are, if I changed the station and went to Fox News, I would find that Fox was highlighting all of those things that CNN wasn't paying attention to and trying to hide or not cover all of those things that CNN was making headlines. This is because both of those forms of mass media have opinions, have political stances, and so they're using their platform of mass media to both focus our attention on something and distract our attention away from something. So we just need to remember um, that mass media is not inherently or good, good or bad, but mass media is also not neutral depending on how we use it to satisfy our needs and desires 
and based on how the source of those messages and that communication are trying to um, focus or distract our attention. Does that make sense? So a lot of times in the news you hear arguments about, oh, all the violence on TV causes people to be more violent, or all the lyrics in this rap music are causing students to act out, uh, or um, this is fake news. Um, no mass media is totally bad or totally good, but we have to remember that whoever the source of that information, whoever the source of that message is, they have some sort of agenda, so we need to ask questions about what their agenda might be to help us discern how to listen to that mass media. And we also have to remember that sometimes the way that we use mass media can be productive or not productive um, in terms of how we get it to serve our needs and desires. So those are some important general lessons about mass media. Now, I want to talk about a guy uh, named Marshall McLuhan. Uh, he is an important guy for you to remember. Uh, Marshall McLuhan was a... Uh, scholar of communication, specifically of mass media, who kind of walked us through the development of mass media. And he talked about five different eras of communication and what happened in each of those eras. So I want you to understand and kind of get what those are. So first, his first era he called the tribal era. And in the tribal area, in the tribal era, the most important form of communication, mass communication, in terms of the way that things could be conveyed to lots of people, was oral communication. So we're talking prehistoric times. Uh, we are talking uh, even kind of um, uh, sort of uh, ancient times, uh, Rome, uh, Greece, um, before the invention of the written word. Um, if we think about uh, Jesus and his disciples, even kind of New Testament, um, the primary form uh, was oral communication. And it's called the tribal era because people lived in tribes or groups or, or, or little communities where the way that they would spread their culture and spread their stories was through oral communication. So if you see, the primary kind of form of oral communication is stories and rituals. How do we pass our stories on, um, our myths about uh, our, religion, our religious faith um, in Christian tradition, uh, parables, uh, stories of Jesus' miracles, etc. Um, and the dominant sense, obviously, in the trial, her tribal era, is hearing. So hearing becomes very important because that is the way that you receive this oral communication that involves stories and rituals. What mass communication and mass media did during this time is fostered cohesive communities. Fostered cohesive communities. So these stories and these oral traditions would allow communities to form. So if you think uh, about the, the first uh, disciples after Jesus died, the apostles, they would go to different countries and set up churches and tell the stories of uh, Jesus' miracles, retell some of these parables. Uh, there would be a lot of preaching and teaching. In these house churches, uh, they would begin to observe uh, the ritual of uh, the Last Supper, we now know it as communion, but taking bread together, taking wine together. And these stories and these rituals would begin to help form a group identity and build some sort of type, type of cohesive community through oral communication. So all of this is called the tribal era, and that is how um, these first forms of um, mass communication occurred through the mass media of stories uh, and rituals. Now, obviously, back then, it took a lot longer for these stories and rituals to kind of travel because people would have to travel on foot from country to country uh, and start telling and talking and sharing and things like that. Greek mythology gets passed down this way um, and other sorts of things. Um, the next era that McLuhan points out is what he calls the literate era. And the literate era begins with the invention of the phonetic alphabet. So once the phonetic alphabet comes into being, all of a sudden we are now in the literate era, and now what is possible is not just oral communication, but written communication. This is where uh, you can start seeing uh, uh, monks starting to write out the Bible. So now the books of the Bible have been canonized, right? They are beginning to write this out. They hand write every single copy of the Bible. So we still are taking a lot of time to get these things out there. Or um, you'll notice that uh, in, in what, what used to be just cave pictures um, telling stories, now 
starts to become um, some type of letter it, uh, letters and, and word. Might not be what we know as the Phoenician alphabet today or the phonetic alphabet, but just the fact, fact that people now have written characters to stand in for words or images. Obviously now the dominant sense in this era becomes seeing, um, and a couple of different things happen here. Um, first, communication goes to to, moves toward privatization. And what I mean by that is um, when I am in the tribal era orally communicating, I'm telling this story to a whole group. Now that I have the potential to kind of write this down, I can privatize the communication and only give it to one person or only give it to two people. Um, in terms of the Bible, in these times, the only people who had Bibles were either monks in monasteries where they were writing it down or very wealthy families, royalty, who could afford to, to pay for, um, to have an entire Bible written out from them. So communication actually narrows a little bit there during this time because not everybody has the capacity to receive the written word. And if I want to have some sort of private communication to you, I send you a message or I write you a letter. So privatization happens. Also, in the literate era, we have less face-to-face -face communication. That makes sense because uh, I can send you letters or send something for you to read. Um, we also find during the literate era that linear thinking and sequential order um, is how humans begin to start thinking. Obviously, when you're telling a story, you can be all over the place. When you are reading words on a page, they occur in a linear order, and the order in which the words occur helps construct the meaning. You flip the words around, all of a sudden you shift the meaning as well. So we find during the literate era that our brains are actually starting to be shaped by mass media. We start thinking in terms of linear thought, sequential order, etc. So that's what happens as we move from the tribal era to the literate era. Next, McLuhan says, we move to the print era, and this era is brought about by the invention of the printing press. So we've gone from stories and rituals to having an alphabet. Now we have a printing press, and this is where we truly enter the first era of mass communication, because now we don't need a monk to spend years and years writing one copy of the Bible. Once we have that Bible, now that we have the printing press, we can mass produce that Bible. We can start to mass produce pamphlets if we are running for political office. Uh, we can mass produce um, textbooks or instructional books to help people uh, become more educated. So we get printing press mass communication. We are still in a dominant sense of seeing, but now what's happening is that we have increased literacy. It's not just the rich people uh, or folks who have access to uh, the ability to write who can learn to read. But now, since these materials are uh, being mass produced, they are no longer as expensive, written materials are easier to come by, more people can begin to learn to read. You have um, a, a sort of increase in schools and universities during this time, uh, and we find that, that um, literacy starts to become more widespread. So after we sort of narrowed from the tribal era to the literate era, as we come into the print era, things start to widen out again. Um, in addition to increased literacy, we have what's called homogeneity. Homogeneity is just the idea of sameness. Now that so many people have access to the same information, uh, we all begin to have a shared body of knowledge. Together, more people know the same things. More people have access to the same information. And that creates what we call an equalizing effect. No longer um, are there as sharp divisions between social classes or between races or groups. Now that folks all have the potential to get this information because of the invention of the printing press, we find that the hierarchy starts to get evened out, right? It's not just the rich people. It's not just the men. It's not just the landowners. It's not just the white um, people who have access to these printed materials. So do women and other races and maybe someone who isn't as economically, um, uh, as, as economically, uh, rich or well-off. Um, and so that's one of the wonderful things that begins to happen with the print era is mass communication kind of moves outward. No surprise, we go from the print era to the electronic era. What brings about this is the invention of all these electronic devices, TV, radio, telegraph, and we are now 
mass communication becomes electronic communication as well. Um, not surprising, the senses here are seeing and hearing. And of course, uh, these are largely uh, 20th century developments. So these are 1930s, 40s, 50s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. We really start to see a boom. So what's interesting is you'll notice as we're going down here, um, each of these eras is shorter and shorter because the rate of technology is increasing faster and faster. We live in the tribal era for a long time. We live in the literate era for a while too where there's writing but no printing. Then printing starts happening, uh, and then we only have a couple hundred years of printing before we get to the electronic communication, and then electronic communication only lasts for a little while until we come into the next era. So you see, each of these eras, we're moving faster and faster because there are all sorts of new technological advancements. Electronic era, of course, means that uh, news stations can start to carry information from uh, wars that are happening in other countries. Uh, it means that uh, messages can be sent through telegraph overseas very quickly. Uh, and, and we start to find, again, that now we are broadening our ability to communicate even more. Um, from electronic era, no surprises, in your lifetime, we move into the digital era. Uh, which is brought about by the internet, smartphones, web, the web, social media. And now we are in virtual communication. Virtual communication, meaning we are communicating very similar to the way that we did way back here in the tribal era, face to face, but we're not actually physically in the same room, right? So right now we are experiencing virtual communication. I'm telling you stories, I'm speaking to you, et cetera, et cetera, but we could be bazillions of miles apart. Um, Obviously, seeing and hearing are important. We also find that in this era, touch becomes important in terms of how we interact with our screens, swiping, hitting buttons, etc. A couple terms that are important here in this digital era. First, um, global village. A global, global village is sort of a combination of what happens in the electronic era and the digital era. But it's this idea that it's almost as though we live in a small, tiny village with people all over the globe because we have immediate access to information. They have immediate access to us, we have immediate access to them, we interact, we engage, and it's this idea that everything is really right at our fingertips, but it's the resources of the world that feel so close to home. The other thing that happens in these two eras is that we have the possibility to know things instantaneously. Um, as each of these eras is getting shorter, right? We spend less time in each of these eras before there's a new technological advancement. Also, in each of these eras, it's, uh, we, we are, have the ability to get access to information much quicker. Tribal era, era, you'd have to wait till a disciple got to your town to tell you the parables of Jesus. Literate era, um, it might happen quicker as soon as somebody was able to write something. Print era, now that these things are printed and mass produced, you can grab something at the library or at your school or at your church. Electronic era, turn on the TV. Digital era, literally pull your phone out of your pocket. So the uh, ability to access information is getting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter and shorter and shorter. Interestingly enough, McLuhan, before he died, said that he thought what was coming next from the digital era was actually some sort of return to some type of modified tribal era. A, both because we have the ability to communicate face to face, but he also thought that um, the digital era was eventually going to get so impersonal um, that, that, that we would start to somehow crave real human connection again and start finding ways to simplify um, back to the tribal era. You know, it's interesting now, um, a lot of people have been talking during this pandemic when we are all separated and we start to crave communi human communication. Um, a lot of folks think that if this goes on for a while, uh, that afterwards we're going to see the pendulum swing back toward a lot more face-to-face -face communication and recognizing what it is maybe that we have lost um, in, in the digital era by communicating so much the way we are now. And some people think it's going to swing back the other way and that you might find a little bit of reaction against this type of communication as people crave um, actual intimacy and connection with other human beings. So this is the way that McLuhan has kind of talked us through the different eras of mass communication. And it's really kind of fascinating stuff. Um, he's got books on each of these. So this is a very, very like 
very, very generic overview, um, but you can dig more into that uh, if, you, if you like. Now, I'm going to switch over here to the other board. While we're talking about the digital era, uh, and kind of what I was saying now about people's dissatisfaction um, with um, some of the things in the digital era, I just want to um, talk a little bit about some of the qualities of this digital era that we're in with mass media. Like, like I said before, mass media is never wholly good or wholly bad. And there's sometimes the tendency to either think it's the answer to everything and it's wonderful or it's just uh, devilish and demonic and horrible. Not true. But here are some things that we need to keep in mind about digital media. First, in the digital era, like we said, it allows information to travel quickly, which is wonderful. We have access to things that we need. Um, we can find out what's happening across the world. It's great when you're cramming late night on a paper and you should have done research earlier. One of the things that we have to be careful of in the digital era with mass media, though, is because information travels quickly and because many people have access to posting things on the internet, we have to remember that information can also be manipulated. So one of the things that we need to be really careful of in the digital era is making sure that our information is reliable. And just because information is quickly accessed and expedient doesn't mean it's truthful, doesn't mean it's reliable, and doesn't mean it's dependable. Um, so one of the things that we find in this digital era is that we have a lot more conversations about the ethics of mass media and the morality of mass communication. Uh, are people having the same standards and concerns for truth as we once did? Um, when you had something written in a book uh, and it could be fact-checked by a few people, uh, people are a lot more careful. Now, folks throw things on the internet, they can post anonymously, uh, you don't necessarily need to attribute your sources, and so there are some dangers that come with um, communication in the digital era. So we, we want to celebrate how quickly we can access information while being really careful about how much we trust that information and how much we verify that information. Second, um, one of the things that's great is it fosters interconnectivity. Uh, we can quickly be connected to other people um, with similar interests and likes and dislikes. We can meet family members who live in other countries who we've not met before, etc. But one of the things we also need to be careful of in the digital era is false intimacy and manufactured identity. Um, and what I mean by this is there is sometimes a tendency um, in the digital era when we are communicating through mass forms of media, being Facebook or social media, Twitter, uh, blogging, websites, um, we have a tendency to manufacture our identities. Um, I'm guilty of this. You probably are guilty of this at some point in time. But just what we put out about ourselves um, might not be untrue, but might not be fully true and might only be partial truth. We all like to put our good parts uh, kind of out there, if you will and maybe kind of hide some of those other parts. Or another thing, when we talk about false intimacy, a lot of times many of us are uh, willing to say things kind of anonymously when we're not face-to-face -face with someone over social media or over text that if we were actually sitting in a room with someone, we would never say, either because it feels too vulnerable or it feels too risky. So one of the things that we need to be careful of is while it's great that through digital media we can foster interconnectivity, we also want to make sure that we are not giving too much of ourselves away. Also, that we're not kind of cloaking and hiding and veiling and being untruthful about um, who our identity is. Um, a lot of that is because we, we often don't know who uh, exactly is on the other side, whether that be a one-on-one -on -one conversation or whether that be something we post to the public on Facebook or something that we put out on a website, or a video that we post up on YouTube. So um, we always want to be careful that we are conveying who we are um, honestly, um, and also appropriately. Sometimes um, there's bits of information that it's not appropriate to put out into the whole stratosphere for the whole world to know. Um, there are things that are better saved for intimate connection with human beings face to face. Relatedly, um, it, it does create social interaction, which is great. Um, the digital era allows people to ask questions and share ideas and pose thoughts and get information. Also, though, um, like a wildfire, um, as information can spread, so can gossip, so can rumors, so can misinformation, so can cyberbullying. So while it's wonderful that the digital era has kind of created social interaction, we have to remember that that social interaction needs to be stewarded well because it can also be used negatively. 
So again, none of this um, means that the digital era is wicked or horrible, and also none of it means that it's the best thing sli through since sliced bread. Um, it just means that as with every form of communication, there are pluses and minuses, and we need to be aware of those pluses and minuses as we engage. Um, that brings us to a term that I want you to remember called media literacy. Um, and here's what we mean by media literacy. Uh, media literacy means, um, you know, as I said at the beginning of the semester, I'm never going to tell you, absolutely, don't watch that movie. Um, I'm never going to say to you, um, um, Fox News is 100% evil. CNN is liberal, fake news, etc. I'm not going to say that. My goal as an instructor, uh, an instructor is not to tell you what to think and not to tell you how to use mass media. My goal is to raise up people who can discern, who can watch movies, listen to songs, watch a news station, read a newspaper, read a magazine, and think critically and discern. So media literacy means just that. When you are encountering mass media, whether it be um, some type of social media site, whether it be a news website that you watch, whether it be a book that you're reading or a magazine article, media literacy means that you yourself have your brain open and your thinking so that you know how to discern the messages that are coming at you so that you can be asking questions like is this message true what source is it coming from what do i need to consider is it reliable um, are maybe the thoughts reliable but the way that that's being conveyed isn't does this feel trustworthy not so a lot of the question a lot of the things that um we think about in media literacy and the way that we stay discerning and wise is asking our questions. Um, first, what are my motivations? Um, do I go to this same news website every, every single day because I just want them to confirm what I already believe and I know they believe similarly? Or am I looking at a variety of news stations so that I can try and get a fully rounded picture and then make an informed decision? So we have to ask, First, what are our motivations? Second, we have to ask, as I'm saying, am I looking at a variety of mass media or am I just getting stuck looking at one type of mass media? Am I always listening to rap music? Do I only watch movies by this person? Uh, am I only reading this magazine articles? Chances are, if we're getting stuck in any one form of mass media, uh, we're not getting a full picture of the world. Um, so we look at our motivations, we look at a range of stuff, we, third, we interrogate messages. We mean we, that means we question messages. If I'm getting a particular message from some form of mass media, I have to ask, is this true? Where is it coming from? Uh, uh, does the source of this message have an agenda? What are they trying to get me to believe or not to believe? Are they trying to sell me something? Are they trying to make money? If so, is this product reliable? This is what we mean by interrogating um, the different messages that we hear. And then finally, we have to actively respond. We have to decide, I'm going to believe this. I'm not going to believe this. I'm going to believe some of this, but I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. Uh, I'm going to stop listening to this mass media, or this mass media is reliable. I'm going to now take action. So examine your motivations. Look at a range of stuff. Interrogate the messages that are coming at you, and then actively respond. Those are the four steps that we talk about when we talk about media literacy and making sure that we are being wise and discerning about how we use mass media. Okay, last I want to talk about three different theories. So we're going back to Marshall McLuhan and Marshall McLuhan um, had three different theories. Uh, he had many, but these are the three we're going to talk about tonight. Um, three different theories uh, about um, mass media and how we use it. So the first is called user and gratification theory. User and gratification theory. So if you remember when we were over at the other board, I was saying with mass media, we all choose our mass media based on how it serves our needs and desires, right? If you're uh, writing a paper, you're going to choose some sort of website or newspaper or magazine that gets you the information that you need to write that paper. If you're looking for a distraction, you're probably going to go to uh, Candy Crush or uh, Facebook or Snapchat uh, or TikTok and kind of just let yourself be distracted through kind of mindless entertainment. We all, we all choose mass media based on our needs and desires, right? And so that's the first part of user and gratification theory. 
as a user of mass media, I'm looking for something that is going to gratify my needs, gratify my desires. Sometimes mass media is helpful in satisfying those needs and desires. Sometimes it is not helpful in satisfying those needs and desires. Sometimes those needs and desires are good needs and desires. Sometimes those needs and desires are not so healthy. User and gratification theory says if we are not finding a form of mass media that gratifies the needs and desires that we have, we will create a new form of mass media to gratify that need. So here's an example. Um, back in the, like I think it was the mid, mid 80s, um, there was a huge marketing agency that had tons and tons and tons of clients. Um, and uh, those clients, were all, they all had a million different projects going on. So we were working on billboards for this company and a website for this company. Well, not a website, because it was the 80s. Uh, a commercial for this company. We're making a video for this company. And all the people at this agency, they were all communicating with the clients. So there are millions of emails flying back. We're sending you a draft of the brochure to look at. You're sending us notes back. Here's uh, the first cut of this commercial. And the agency realized that they, their email boxes were just like overrun with crazy kind of all sorts of gross stuff. Um, so they started creating a system. Uh, they went in and created a platform where they began to have sort of like a different folder for each client. So here's Nabisco, here's Toyota, here's uh, 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 Chase Bank, whoever their clients were. And they began putting the work in each of those uh, folders. Um, uh, and then they also only invited certain people from their agency to different one of those folders. So if I'm not working on the project with Toyota, I don't need to be uh, in that folder. Um, they also invited their clients to be able to view the folders. And what happened is they began to have a lot more um, uh, helpful ways of kind of sifting projects. Not everybody was getting a million kind of different communications uh, and people could be on it. So they sell this or they, they work with this for a while and then eventually they sell this for a lot of money because they've now created this really helpful tool. And now we know this today as Google Drive. Uh, and Google Drive is now made that available to millions of billions of people, anyone who has a Gmail account. So this is an example of where there was no um, kind of existing platform in mass media to satisfy the need of this company. So they created something for them. They eventually expanded it. They monetized it. They made a lot of money off of it. And now Google is making a lot of money off of it. So that's user and gratification theory. User and gratification theory, again, says two things. One, as users, we look for mass media that will satisfy or gratify our needs and desires. Two, if we can't find a form of mass media that does that, does that we will likely invent a new form of mass media to do just that. Cool? Next, agenda setting theory. This is sort of what we were talking about a little bit before. Agenda setting theory says this, mass media covers topics in a way that they get us to pay attention to them or ignores topics that they don't want us to pay attention to. Let me say that again. Agenda setting theory says this, mass media covers topics in a way to get us to pay attention to them and then ignores other topics in a way to get us to not pay attention to them, okay? And what that means is that mass media, all mass media has an agenda. It's not neutral. That doesn't mean that the agenda is always evil and wicked. It just means that there is an agenda, right? News stations all have a political bias. So they are going to cover certain things and they are going to ignore other things because they want you to um, listen to their bias, right? Some stations are more biased than others and that becomes obvious in the way that they cover things. Hmm? Um, you see a commercial. A commercial is a form of mass media. Okay? A commercial might be called an infomercial saying, hey, we're just giving you a lot of helpful information that you need. But at the end of the day, it is a commercial which is trying to sell something. So they are going to highlight certain things about that product and they are going to hide or ignore uh, other things about that product. All mass media has some sort of agenda and they will try to make that agenda your agenda as well. And so that's what we mean by agenda setting theory. So as you can see, this is one of the reasons why media literacy becomes important. So you can say, what is the agenda uh, of this form of mass media? Um, we use the term when we're talking about agenda setting theory, or Marshall McLuhan does, um, gatekeepers. And the gatekeepers 
are the folks behind the scene who are helping set those agenda. So this is the owner of uh, a news station. These are producers. These are editors of books and magazines who decide what stays in the article and what gets cut out of the article. This is publishers deciding uh, who's going to um, have uh, space in a newspaper and what's going to be on the front page and what's going to be hidden 15 or 16 pages back. Uh, these are advertisers. These are political action groups who want you to know some facts about this bill that Congress is trying to pass and want you to not know other facts so that you will um, pressure your congressman or senator to vote for this or to not vote for this. These are the gatekeepers. The gate gatekeepers are the people who help set the agenda for a particular form of mass media. So that's agenda setting theory. Um, lastly, um, Marshall McLuhan talks about cultivation theory. And cultivation theory says this. Cultivation theory says that mass media promotes a worldview that is inaccurate, but that we start to take as reality. Reality. Let me say that again. Cultivation theory says that mass media promotes a worldview that is inaccurate, but that we take as reality. Example, magazine ads, TV, um, we start to see certain messages sent to us about what is beautiful, right? And there is a cultural standard. Ladies, blonde, skinny, well endowed here, long legs, flawless skin. We see this over and over and over and over again, and it gets reinforced. Gentlemen, full head of hair, not muscular, uh, 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 shining, gleaming teeth, uh, um, strong, capable. How many of us actually look like the majority of people that we see in ads and TVs? Not very many of us, but we see this enough that it begins to cultivate this idea of what is beautiful or what is handsome, that regardless of whether we want to or not, um, begins to kind of infiltrate our culture and that we begin to take as reality. And so for many of us, we begin to measure ourselves up against these, up against these standards, find ourselves wanting, which then leads to all sorts of problems. Uh, another good example of cult, uh, cultivation theory. Um, uh, in the uh, 1970s, early 80s, um, when you would see television sitcoms, um, you would see white nuclear families, mom, dad, and a couple of kids. That's what you always saw. And so it began to cultivate this idea that this is what a family looks like, right? White, mom, dad, couple kids, pretty affluent. That, that's what family means. Well, eventually, a number of people started speaking up and being like, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This doesn't look like my family. So soon you start to have the advent of shows like the, the Cosby Show, which was the first show about a black uh, family um, it, it, that, that really kind of caught hold with mainstream popular culture. There had been other shows like Good Times or The Jeffersons or things like that. But in, in that time, when the TV looked exclusively white, that was a major change. You also start to see TV shows about blended families, uh, two parents who've been divorced with kids who now bring those together. You start to see TV shows with more a traditional families. So this would be an example of where cultivation theory started to take hold and uh, people said, no, 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 wait a second. This does, not, this does not match up with my experience. And so I'm going to challenge this worldview that mass media seems to be putting out there. That's why we want to know these two terms, mainstreaming and resonance. Mainstreaming is when um, a worldview sort of enters the mainstream and we start to accept it, right? Um, that is when mass media successfully cultivates uh, this idea, whatever it is, this is what beauty looks like. This is what um, this is what uh, family looks like. Uh, this is what black people are like. Um, mainstreaming is when we, as a culture, start to buy into the messages that mass media is sending us. The way that we break that, the way that we challenge that, is through this idea of resonance. Resonance is when we ask the question: Is does is mass media, is what mass media is putting out there congruent with my experience? Does it resonate with me? Do I look at the message that mass media is sending and does that resonate with my life? All the people that I know are not blonde haired, blue eyed, gorgeous, physically fit, etc. So that doesn't resonate with me. Or 
I consider myself to be a fairly beautiful, handsome person, and I don't match that, okay? Or in the case of the TV shows, people being like, time out, that doesn't look like my family. That's what not my experience of family. So that's what we mean by resonance, asking the question, does this resonate with my experience? And if not, how do I challenge mass media to do a better job portraying a worldview that seems more realistic? So review, user and gratification theory. We go to mass media to fulfill our needs and desires. If there isn't a form of mass media that does that, we invent something new. Agenda setting theory, all mass media will either cover something in a way to, distract, uh, to attract your attention and make you focus on that, or it will choose to not cover something and ignore something to kind of distract and turn you away from that. Gatekeepers are the folks who are in charge of setting those agendas and making it happen. And then cultivation theory, mass media promotes a worldview that is inaccurate, but that over time, as it happens very slowly, we begin to take as reality. That's called mainstreaming, when those beliefs work themselves into the culture. Resonance is when we start asking the question, does this uh, worldview match up with my experience? If not, it doesn't resonate, and then I need to challenge. You can see in all of these, this is why media literacy becomes very important. We have to ask ourselves, are the needs and desires that I want to fulfill good needs and desires, and am I going to the right place? We have to ask ourselves, what is this news station or what is this movie trying to get me to pay attention to? What are they not talking about? And is that okay that they're not talking about it? Or should I be paying attention to that very thing they're telling me to ignore? Cultivation theory, is this worldview accurate? Sometimes the worldview that mass media puts out there is accurate and is a reflection of the culture. Sometimes it's not, and that's when we have to get literate and ask, does this resonate with me? Hope that all makes sense. That is a round robin of mass media. Have a good one.